Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Ezra, chapter 7. Ezra, chapter 7. We'll pick up where we left off last week. We read through verse 10, made some observations, the first 10 verses. Let's read verses 11 through 20 tonight. Ezra 7, beginning with verse 11. I made it, this is Artaxerxes the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, <clears throat> writing, I made a decree that all they of the people of Israel, no, no, I'm sorry, wrong verse, back up, verse 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra, the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the, com of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, and of his priests and Levites, in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king, and of his seven counselors, to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the provinces, excuse me, all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the, pe of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and gold, that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. Whatsoever more shall be needed, excuse me, needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. He's given a real blank check there mm -hmm. to uh, take the money that King Artaxerxes has given to him and trade that and buy whatever they need to <coughs> fill the temple as they rebuild it. Notice in verse 11, uh, just as in verses 6 and 10 last time, that a ready scribe is one that is a scribe, quote, of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes. Not simply a scholar of some sort of Talmudic uh, rabbinical tradition, but a scholar uh, of the word of God, a scribe. Uh, you know, the word scholar is used two times in the King James Bible, and in both references, it is a reference to a student, not to an expert. That's what a scholar means. It means a student, not some expert in any field. But uh, also notice verse 12 calls Artaxerxes king of kings. And we need to uh, couple that with Ezekiel 26, if you'll run over there. Ezekiel 26 And notice one verse there, verse 7. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings, from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. There, Nebuchadnezzar, only the spelling is altered a bit in that passage. And Nebuchadnezzar is also called a king of kings. Now I want you to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, and let's notice what the King James translators did with a similar phrase. Revelation 19, and notice there verse 16. Well, let's back up to verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. 
and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Um, the King James translators printed the words in all capital letters. And uh, they, they thus drew a, a clear distinction between those who said, or, they, or of, of whom it was said they were King of Kings, and one who truly is. That's for the benefit of the reader, for no one else's benefit. And um, do you realize there is no indication in any Hebrew manuscript or any Greek New Testament manuscript or any Syrian or Aramaic manuscript, which is what uh, Artaxerxes' letter would have been written in at the time. There is no indication in any of those languages that that verse, Revelation 19.16, should be in all caps. But they did it anyway in 1611, and I'm glad they did. Um, they did it anyway. Uh, and then, back in our text, verse 13 describes those, quote, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem. Free will is a Bible term. <coughs> the phrase, the sovereignty of God, is thrown around by uh, Calvinists, is not a Bible term. Also, verse 15 says the king's counselors have freely offered. And verse 16 mentions the free will offering of the people. Let's uh, couple that with what we read back in Exodus chapter 35. Go back there, Exodus 35. Exodus 35, and verses 21 and 22. It says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And jump down at verse 26. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And verse 29. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Nothing John Calvin taught. John Calvin was a, a bright light in his day, 1500, 16th century. He was uh, referred to as the Protestant Pope of a Pope-hating people. That's not a bad moniker, not a bad title to have. The Protestant Pope of a Pope-hating people. and um, But he was not real deep or correct in the way he interpreted the Bible. I think the problem is, and uh, this problem has repeated itself in the lives of some former Catholics, or particular uh, Father uh, Alberto Rivera, who, who uh, Jack Tick did the whole comic book series on. In Roman Catholicism, Everything is up to you. It's up to you to earn your way into heaven, to make sure you take the seven sacraments, to make sure you take the wine and the, and the uh, wafer and Holy Communion as often as you can, to confess your sins, uh, to be an obedient follower of the church, to abide by their rules when it comes to getting married, getting buried, uh, baptizing your children, donating to the church, believing what you're told and taught. It is entirely up to you to be obedient uh, in hopes of getting to heaven one day. And when someone with that extreme, uh, I must do it on my own mentality, is confronted with the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered for your sake, uh, he died for every sin you would ever commit or ever have committed, and there's nothing you can do to add to it except trust in his mercy and his kindness, 
then I think the, the temptation for a lot of people is to swing to the opposite extreme and say, well, then God must have to do all of it. God is the one who chose me. God is the one who did the saving. He caused me to repent. He caused me to uh, be interested in the gospel and respond to the gospel. I had nothing to do with it. I have no free will. We're over here. Everything was up to my free will to be obedient. Over here, nothing is up to my will. God is the one that does it all. And uh, both extremes, of course, are wrong. Uh, and um, Dr. Rivera uh, tended to swing towards the ultra-Calvinistic belief. And it's unfortunate because he had a great testimony of how God saved him out of that system. And uh, I don't think he was the only one who uh, was tempted in that direction. Martin Luther naturally was tempted to believe in what the Reformers uh, were teaching, that since it's not up to me, it must be all up to God. And he wasn't as extreme as uh, the Calvinists were in John Calvin uh, in Scotland. But uh, that uh, alternative view seemed to be very prevalent in the 1600s and uh, even later in the 1700s. And it's un unfortunate that some people still think that's how you approach the scriptures today. If, uh, if everything that, and John Calvin said, if everything that happens uh, in your life happens because God so willed it to happen, then why are there so many admonitions in the Bible against wickedness, against sin, against evil, telling you to choose you this day whom you will serve uh, if you have no choice? Why would God, why is the Bible so filled with admonitions and um, admonishments to live holy, to live righteously and godly in this present world, and uh, to obey the Word of God rather than disobey it, uh, if you ultimately have no free will in the matter at all? Uh, Nothing John Calvin taught about free will was true. Your free will alone will decide where you spend eternity. You will either spend eternity in hell because you've rejected Jesus Christ, or you will one day live in New Jerusalem because you have received him. And it's entirely up to you to come into line with God's desire for you to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Calvinists use verses like Philippians 2.13, uh, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, as a way of suggesting that uh, everything you do in life was because God so willed it, willed that you should do it. Uh, even repenting, he willed that to, to come to pass. So, but don't tell me that it's God's good pleasure that prompts you to oversleep, to overeat, to uh, lie to your boss, to badmouth or, or slander someone else, or commit fornication, or, or uh, any number of other sins, and neglect prayer, and neglect your Bible reading like so many Christians do. Uh, don't tell me that it's God's good pleasure that you would do any of those things. And yet, that's ultimate Calvinism um, in its ultimate form, rather. It has nothing to do with either testament. And then verse 14 in our text, Ezra 7, verse 14, For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand. Uh, this he addresses to Ezra specifically. Uh, the seven counselors should be compared with uh, those mentioned also in the book of Esther. Go forward just a little bit after Nehemiah, Esther, and chapter 1. And let me read verses 14 down through verse 19. Second. Ezra, or rather Esther 1, and beginning there at verse 14. And the next unto him was, well, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marsina, and Memucan. 
the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, when it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Now, there is a typology of something taking place in the spiritual world in this story. In the story of Esther, Vashti is a Gentile queen who is going to be replaced by a Jewish virgin, Esther. And this would be a, a type, if you will, a, a picture of the virgin daughter of Zion, as Israel is often called in the scriptures. 2 Kings 19, Isaiah 23, Isaiah 37, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 14, and Lamentations 2. All of those passages refer to the virgin daughter of Zion as a collective term for the entire nation, the Jews, Israel. And uh, the rule of the Gentile nations will end at the second advent of the Lord Jesus, and then a Jewish virgin of Israel will begin to reign. And this you can extrapolate from Romans chapter 11, verses 25, 26, 27. The, the fullness of the Gentiles uh, has not yet come, be, come in. And so right now, the Gentile nations... Gentile countries of the world, Gentile politics, uh, and Gentile economics are running the world system. But it's not going to last forever. There's that dumb doofus uh, running for Congress back in New York. Uh, what, how old is she? 26, 27? Um, she's more than likely to get elected. She's saying, a, a, uh, this is a capitalist system in America, but capitalism won't always exist. Well, if if you and I, as American citizens, have anything to say about it, it will exist, uh, long after she's uh, no longer in Congress. But the way they're making a heroine out of her, uh, someone with uh, poor communication skills and no knowledge of American history uh, is going to run for Congress and probably get elected. <clears throat> but it's very unfortunate, and it's bad for the country. But, um, so, the rule of the Gentile kingdoms, the Gentile domination of the world's politics right now, will one day come to an end. That will come to an end when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and defeats the man of sin and all of his armies in the Battle of Armageddon uh, and institute his millennial reign. But it also is an indirect reference to the 144,000 wise Jews, as they're referred to, in Revelation 7, verse 4, and in Matthew 25, during the tribulation, 144,000. <clears> and something else about these seven counselors. There are pictures of the seven spirits mentioned in the book of Revelation. If you want to run forward to Revelation 4, Revelation 4, And notice there, Revelation 4, verse 5. It says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And uh, that can be a very perplexing, vague, ambiguous phrase. 
if someone doesn't, hasn't been taught to compare Scripture with Scripture. But since these are seven uh, emanations of the Holy Spirit, um, they're listed for us back in Isaiah 11. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, and let's notice the first two verses there. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Notice verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, one. The Spirit of wisdom, two. And understanding, three. The Spirit of counsel, four. And might, five and the spirit of knowledge, six, and of the fear of the Lord, seven, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, so forth. I was riding in the funeral hearse, or I was driving a funeral hearse, and there was a, a woman Lutheran minister uh, who had wanted to ride in the hearse with me to a cemetery. We got to talk about spiritual matters, and this subject came up with her one time, and she was, and I said, you ever, I said, there are seven different expressions of the Holy Spirit listed there in Isaiah 11, verse 2, and uh, Revelation 4 says there are seven spirits before the throne of God. Isaiah 1 Verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. <clears throat> and the believer is washed clean from his sin. His sins are washed clean so that his soul is as white as snow in the eyes of God. I said, hey, have you ever thought about um, imagery in the Bible that we see depicted in daily life all around us, and yet we don't give the Bible credit for being the, the source of that <clears throat> imagery. Snow White had seven dwarves that accompanied her on her life, according to the story. And, of course, there's this minstrel that was sitting next to me. She's just, wow, I never thought about that. Has anyone ever thought about now the Bible says that Christ comes back and his vesture and his thigh are, are blood up to the horse's bridle, the valley of Armageddon. Just, just, he's just trampling through the blood of his enemies. And I said, what do we roll out for dignitaries to walk on? He said, the red carpet. He said, all of that is a picture of something that's either taken place in the past or it's going to take place in the future in the word of God. And by this time, her head was spinning. She said, man, I should have you come back to my church and teach the Bible to my people. And I said, I'd be honored to do that if you ever call me, but she's never called. And those kinds of things are all around us. I was driving down the road. We lived in Florida years ago, and there was a, a billboard for uh, Sherwin-Williams, some paint store in town, and they had seven different colors of paint all the buckets tipped out and the paint running out of all seven of them. And I thought, there's seven vials being poured out in the tribulation. And um, then their logo is a bucket of red paint over the globe, and their slogan is, cover the earth. And uh, the waters are going to be turned to blood one day, and there won't be any water to drink uh, when God begins to pour out wrath upon the earth in the tribulation. That's all of those things all around us. And I suppose you and I could just keep an eye out. We'd see things like this all the time. We were talking the other day about how often the scriptures are mentioned in movies and television shows. And there's only one version of, of the Bible that Hollywood knows anything about, the King James text. Anything else just doesn't sound like the Bible. Americans and the American ear, English ear, are used to hearing these and thou's as part of the, the holy language of God. And uh, plus, the Hollywood would have to get copyright permission from all of those publishers 
who have copyrights on their Bibles. There is no copyright on the King James text. Anyone can use it and quote from it. But, um, but Snow White had seven dwarves, just as the believer has the seven spirits of God that ought to lead and direct uh, his thinking as they're um, enumerated in Isaiah 11. Uh, then verse 15, back in our text, and to carry the silver and gold which the king of, and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. We should remind ourselves, which we did uh, two or three lessons back, it says the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. Uh, habitation comes from uh, the word habit, something, someplace you're habitually used to dwelling at. And uh, God's habitation is not in Rome, Italy. God's habitation is not <clears throat> at the Vatican City. God's habitation is not in Mecca <clears throat> or Medina. Uh, it's not in Salt Lake City. It's not in Los Angeles. It's not in New York. God's habitation, according to his own word, is the city of Jerusalem. The city of peace is what Jerusalem means. The city of peace. And there's never been any lasting peace there. But that city was so named uh, in preparation for the Prince of Peace one day. There's where, that's where he's going to reign and rule from. And um, the, the city of Jerusalem does not belong to the Muslims or to the Arabs. It belongs to the Jew. It doesn't belong to the Americans or the United Nations. It belongs to Israel, to the Jewish people. And then, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, or well, the rest of the chapter, or the rest of this section, <clears throat> verses, well, let's just read them again before we conclude, verses 16 through 19. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and gold, that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. Like I said, uh, Ezra and all of the Levites and the people who are returning to Jerusalem after Babylon for 70 years, they're given a, a, a blank check from King Artaxerxes. Uh, my counselors and I are giving you gold and silver freely. He said they freely offered it. And uh, you take that and you buy whatever you need to furnish the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, whatever's left over, whatever you have, you, you put that to whatever good use you think is best uh, as God leads and directs. Sometimes we don't realize that God has given to us a blank check when it comes to prayer, that um, nothing should be <clears throat> prohibited from us asking from God. And he may say no, he may say yes, he may say not right now, he may say I have something better for you. So the believer should never um, be afraid to ask a certain thing. Now, there are some dumb things that you ought to have better sense about asking. You know, we don't pray, Lord, uh, please make this lottery ticket be the winner. You know, I mean, uh, help me not to get too tipsy with this bottle of wine or this six-pack of beer. Now, there's certain things you shouldn't even be involved in anyway, so you shouldn't even, those questions shouldn't come up. But when you ask um, in faith, believing that God will give you understanding of the Bible, if you just be faithful to it and not doubt it, just believe what you're reading is the Word of God, from cover to cover, and now trust that God will begin to teach it to you as you go, little by little, reading it every day, work your way through from cover to cover. It's amazing how many interesting things you see in there. Uh, there's a story in the Old Testament. You know how when we were all kids, we'd shove pillows under the blankets to make someone think we were still in bed? There's a story of a guy that did that in the Old Testament. Um, and uh, all kinds of things in there that, that so I never thought the Bible talked about that. I never that was in there. Yeah, it's in there. 
And um, sometimes when you hear that David and his men are inside the cave, hiding from Saul, and Saul went into the cave to um, do his business, that's to relieve himself, and they're talking to each other, the Lord's delivered your enemy into your hand, it just stands to reason that how would you be talking to your friend inside a cave if your enemy was not that far from you? You'd be whispering. So you read that, and you have to, ha you have, to have a whispering voice in your head as you're reading it through the, in your Bible reading. <clears throat> and when the Lord Jesus preached, and uh, thousands were listening to him every day, and the Sermon on the Mount, thousands following him, hanging on every word, he had to shout. He had to preach out loud so that everyone could hear. Sometimes when we read it, the language is so elegant and graceful, we sometimes fail to remember that he had to be bellowing it out, shouting it out loud, so everyone could hear. And of course, everyone probably uh, polite enough to keep their mouths shut so they could hear every word. They didn't want to miss anything when the Lord Jesus spoke. And um, very few cases like that in the world today, if any. And uh, so there are a lot of things you find in the Bible. Just you say, I never knew the Bible talked about that. When I first decided I was going to read the Bible, I was about 18, 19 years old when I decided to read the Bible from cover to cover for the very first time. And when I discovered that John the Baptist and Jesus were actually cousins, so I never knew that. For some reason, I didn't learn that in Sunday school growing up. Or if the teacher mentioned it, it went over my head. <laughs> I didn't retain it. And so all kinds of things jump out at you, just little details you never think would be in the Scripture, but they're in there. And um, it becomes a more interesting book, and you say, well, once I get to the end, I'm going to go back and read it through again, see what I might have missed. And uh, very few other books have that kind of a hold on the reader and that, that inspire the reader to say, I want to read it again and again and again and again. I can't get enough. I don't think you could fully exhaust the Word of God in this life. It would take you uh, 10 or 12 lifetimes reading it through cover to cover, uh, day after day, uh, dozens of times each lifetime, and still not exhaust all of it. That's the amazing thing about the Word of God. 